all on them. It's some I brought from one of them. Let me see if that's sweet. One of them is food or something. It just needs to be washed. I don't know which one. There's two more out there. Y'all both grab them. Okay.
us to go out and spread your message and your love to others. I pray all these things in his holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
to mourn this ingratitude. His first sin of the day often leads to many others. Let me not forget that I have an eternal duty to love, honor, and obey you, because you are infinitely worthy, and that if I fail to glorify you, I am guilty of infinite evil that deserves infinite punishment. For sin is a violation of our infinite obligation to an infinite being. Please forgive me for dishonoring you. Melt my heart, feel my backsliding, and open my soul to your love. Help me to never forget that you have my heart in your hands. Apply Christ's atoning blood to all of my sin. Let your mercy draw me closer to you. Set me free from all evil. Mortify me to the world, and make me ready for my departure to come. Amen. Now hear these words of comfort again from Romans 8, 28 through 30. <clears throat> and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Please take a moment for personal reflection, repentance, and prayer, either individually or with a few others around you.
How can we be saved? Only by faith in Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God and are still inclined to all evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe in him. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your undoing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Amen. Good morning again, church. Good morning. Today I'll be preaching from Psalm 54. Just kidding. Not there yet. We're still working on it. Um, it's my honor to want to do our announcements for the day. First up, we have um, the worship team. We're growing, and we're going to grow in terms of um, uplifting children within the church or some of our current visitors or our congregation. So if anyone is interested in helping us out, we are looking for vocalists. We're always looking for uh, technicians. Um, and it's not necessarily a every Sunday thing, but we would love to have you guys on board. Or if anyone who's interested in that, please email me or come talk to me after service or for service, and um, I would really love to have you guys part of the team. Um, and basically, it's leading God, our leading worship uh, through God, and to continue to praise and walk with Him. So, also, if you're new here, um, if you look on the inside of your row, uh, we have a welcome card, and we just like a little bit of information so that we can send a greeting card and thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, and if you have any questions about our church, feel free to see Pastor Ken or um, one of our uh, morning elders after service today. Amen. Last but certainly not least. Uh, we have a prayer ministry. Uh, if you guys have any emails or requests, uh, we actually got an email last night um, from someone who delivered a baby last night. So that is one of God's um, blessings that has given us through this church. So amen for that. And we will continue to pray for um, that family and for those who are getting uh, sick or, or any good news that may happen in the church. Uh, that concludes our announcements for today. Next time, I want to invite up Pastor Kent, who will lead us in our kingdom prayer. Amen. Please join me in our kingdom prayer this morning. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that as we have sung already this morning that you are great, that you are our strength, that we can do nothing apart from you. Jesus, you told us this yourself in John 15, that if we abide in you, that we will bear much fruit, that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so this morning, as we look at your psalm in Psalm 54, David also acknowledges that the Lord is the one who ups, upholds us. It is the Lord who is our help and our strength. And so, Lord, we pray that we would come in humility this morning, that we would stop trying to do things on our own, that you would help us to acknowledge our weakness, that we are not strong, and that we need your help. This takes much Humbling, And so we pray that you would do that in our hearts this morning. Speak to us by your word. And Lord, through this, make your power known in our weakness, as Paul wrote about in his letter. That through our understanding of our need and our understanding of our sin and our weakness, that your grace would be sufficient for us. And that through you making your grace known to us, that we would see the power that is at work with us, within us, by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we also pray that we would be able to demonstrate that power again, not in and of our own strength, but through your love as it pours out of us because you have first poured it into us. That we would be able to interact with those outside of our normal um, our normal life and bubbles that we would interact with people with strangers with neighbors uh, with those who live or act differently from us that we might show them the mercy of Christ that we would share with them the love of Christ and that 
they would also experience the power of Christ that is at work in those who believe. Lord, we do pray that your kingdom would come. There, there have been many requests this week that you would help those who are weak physically. Pray that you would be present with those who are sick, who are hurting physically, who uh, have been facing symptoms with different illnesses. Lord, we especially pray uh, as we got a request last night about this, this baby, Bretta, who uh, was born less than two pounds and who has several different um, ailments going on. We just pray that you would be with that family, be with those who are caring for her, and we pray that you would show up powerfully in that situation to bring healing, uh, to bring full development in her, and that she would be able to have a life that uh, really glorifies you because of how you work in her. And we pray that you would you would make yourself known to her one day, that she would know you. Lord, we pray that uh, this situation and many others, you would show up and make yourself known. That your name would really be great in our town and in our world. That people, when they hear your name, would respond with joy and with praise and with thanks when they think of all that you have done for them. Pray now as we come to our passage this morning in Psalm 54 that your name would be great to us this morning and that you would speak to us by your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please open your Bible to Psalm 54. We're going to be in Psalm 54 this morning. And uh, before I read that, what you'll see at the beginning of this psalm, again, if you remember last week we looked, or two weeks ago, we looked at the situation that David was in when he wrote the psalm in Psalm 52. Well, this week, what we see at the beginning of this psalm is that this psalm was written when the Ziphites, at the beginning of that, uh, that psalm there, it says, when the Ziphites went out and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? And so, again, uh, when we have those introductions to these psalms, I think it is helpful for us to understand what's, what's the setting. What is the story behind David writing this psalm? Just like it's sometimes very helpful and interesting to know the stories that are written behind uh, several of the psalms or songs that we like to listen to today in our world. And so the, the back story is this. If you were to go to 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 26, you can read about this, but David, as many of you know, David was on the run from Saul. Saul was the king. He had been chosen by the people because he was tall and he was strong. Uh, he, had a, he had a kind of a domineering stature, and so he looked like a king that the culture that the world would choose. So People chose Saul, and uh, they, they wanted Saul as king. Well, later, Samuel, the prophet, uh, anointed David. And David was the youngest of a family. He was kind of a runt of the family. He was a shepherd boy, which shepherd, shepherds, you know, in the, Christian, um, in the Christian culture, shepherding and shepherds has become a place of honor. Uh, but back in Bible times, shepherds were really looked down on. It was never intended to be a, an honorable title. It was, a, it was a title of servitude, and it was a title of kind of the outcast. That's where we put the people who uh, don't really know how to do much else. They're going to be shepherds. And so David was a shepherd, but he was anointed king. And David became a great fighter, a great warrior. And he started, his name started to be known. And people would sing songs about him and say things like, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul became jealous. Saul didn't like this guy, David. Uh, at one point he did like him and now he doesn't because he's jealous and he, he, has, he feels like this is a threat. So David has to go on the run from Saul. Well, at one point in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and in 1 Samuel chapter 26, two different occasions... You see, David, he is uh, he's hiding from Saul in these mountains, these hills. And the first situation we see is that Saul comes 
into a cave, and the language there is a little um, a, a little telling, but Saul is basically going in to relieve himself. He's gone into this cave to, to have some privacy, and David is in there hiding. And David's men are around him, and they say, David, this is your chance. You can kill him. And so David sneaks up right behind Saul, and he cuts off a piece of Saul's clothes. Because that piece off, and then later when Saul's done and he goes back out, David comes out and says, you know, calls him king and says, look what I have. It basically shows Saul that I've taken a part of your clothes, I've cut it off at the corner of your robe, I could have killed you. And Saul sees that and really is, is humiliated by that. Well, two chapters later, Saul ends up leaving and then comes back on the chase, is chasing after David again. And again, David has an opportunity to kill Saul. Saul is sleeping, and David is able to sneak into their camp where Saul is sleeping. And he takes his sword and his helmet... And then he leaves again, sneaks out, and the next day he's able to show Saul again, look, I could have killed you. This is the second time I've spared your life. Why are you coming after me? And so that's, that's the situation that David is in. He, he believes he's showing faithfulness to God because God did anoint Saul through the process of the people choosing Saul. So he says, I'm not going to lay a hand against the Lord's anointed. I'm going to wait for my time. I'm going to be patient. I'm not going to act in revenge against Saul. And so that's the situation we come to with Psalm 54. So just imagine yourself in that situation with David. You're on the run. Your life is constantly in threat. And yet, you don't see it as your job to enact revenge on your enemy. And that's the situation David's in. So Psalm 54, look at your Bible at Psalm 54, and we'll read that this morning. O oh God, save me by your name, and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me, ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves, Selah. Behold, God is my helper, the Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return to the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Let's pray again. Holy Spirit, now as we come to the preaching of your word, as we have just read it, I pray that you would speak through me and speak to us the truth of what is here in this passage and see how it applies to our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I want you to see from our psalm this morning is that the Lord's name is great to the believer. The Lord's name is great to the believer, and we're going to look at that in a few points. First, that the Lord's name is great. You see that here? Uh, his name is great. And then we're going to see that the Lord hears and helps his people. And then because of that, because the Lord's name is great, because he helps his people, he hears and helps his people, the third thing we're going to see is what our response to that good news is. How do we respond? And so first, the Lord's name is great. You see this, uh, Jesus, uh, David is saying this here about, uh, about God. He says, Oh God, save me by your name and hear my prayer. So David is really calling on the name of God, of the name of Yahweh. Later you see that he says in verse 6 that he will give thanks to your name, O Lord. And that Lord in all capital there is the name, the covenant name, Yahweh. Or Jehovah, depending on the background that you grew up in. Yahweh, the name of the Lord, the name of God that he gave to his people to call him by. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of background on that name. We've done this a few times, but it's just a refresher course. What is so significant about God's name, specifically the name Yahweh, the name Jehovah? This is the name that God gave Moses 
to go give to his people. If you go back in Exodus, you can read this story. But Moses is meeting with God. He's meeting with the Lord. And he says, who should I tell the people that has sent me? Because in those days, for someone to come and declare uh, an authoritative message, they're going to say, what authority do you have? Who sent you here? Was it the king? Was it a prince? Was it some kind of governor? Whose name are you speaking on behalf of? And so Moses asked God, who should I tell them? What should, what should I tell them? And God said, tell them, Yahweh, Jehovah, has sent you. And that name, Yahweh, actually comes from a verb form in the Hebrew that it, it, it's kind of hard to translate in one specific tense. When I talk about tense, you, you remember from grammar school and English school that you have different tenses in, the, in your verb forms. You've got past tense, and you've got present tense, and you've got future tense. Do you all remember that? Give me a head nod or something, okay? All right, we're doing a little bit of grammar this morning. Well, the name Yahweh that God gives Moses, it doesn't really have a tense. The way that comes out is that basically God says, tell them that Yahweh, I am, has sent you. But that word, I am, can also be translated, I was, and I am, and I will be. And so God's name literally means, I'm the eternal one. I'm the one who has always existed, and I'm the one who, who always will exist. You see how there's so much cap captured up in that one name? And so that's, that's God's name, but then also God reveals his name, Yahweh, in the context of the covenant. Now the covenant in the Old Testament was the promise that God made to his people specifically that he would be their God and they would be his people, that they would belong to him and that he would be their God forever, that he would not abandon them, he would not forsake them. So wrapped up in the name of God, Yahweh, is all of this truth. This is the God who has always existed, who always will exist, and this is the God who has promised his people, who I am a part of by faith, that he will never leave me, and that I will always be with him. That, there's a lot to that. You see that? And so David, in this psalm, is going back to who God has revealed himself to be, and he's saying, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord. I'm going to trust in him, and I'm going to pray to him on behalf of his name. And then later we'll see that I'm going to praise him on behalf of his name. Why? Because he is the only true God. He's the one who has always existed, who exists now, and who always will be. And what we'll see if you fast forward to the New Testament is that this is actually the same title and the same authority and the same significance that is given to Jesus. New Testament actually says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now, he doesn't change either. And if you go through all these passages, which I'm getting a little bit ahead of my notes, but you go through all these passages in the New Testament, and you find out that Jesus is given the same position and authority and name of the covenant God in the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus is Yahweh. Now, that's, that's really heretical to certain people. Uh, if you know anything about the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormon faith, this is heretical to say something like that, to, to put Jesus equal with God because he is God. But that's exactly what we're going to see as we fast forward to the New Testament. So all of this to say that David is trusting in who God has revealed himself to be through his name. He's calling on the name of the Lord. He's saying, Save me by your name, vindicate me by your might. So David is saying, I'm not, I'm not going to trust in my own strength, in my own power. He could have taken Saul's life twice, but he says, I'm going to trust in the Lord's power, the Lord's time. And he says, vindicate me by your might. That word vindicate, it, it can be also translated justify. Y'all are familiar a little more with the term justify. Justify means to be declared not guilty or to be to de declare righteous or not uh, not chargeable, basically. It's the, you see that gavel up there, it's it's a term that would have been used in, in legal systems. 
So when you have the gavel come down with the verdict, that would, that verdict could have been he is justified, he's not guilty, or he is vindicated. All charges have been dropped. That's what David is saying is, Lord, vindicate me by your might. I'm not going to try to prove my own innocence. I want you to justify me. I want to trust in your righteousness and trust in your vindication. And so that's really what's going on. And David is also saying that I'm going to, I'm going to come under the care and under the name of the Lord. Uh, when I was in middle school or high school, uh, one of the places we go every year for vacation with my side of the family is Lake Huey. My parents actually have a house up there now, uh, close to the lake, so we can go, we can swim, and do all that fun stuff. But we've been going there since I was a kid. When we first started going, we had friends that owned a house up there that they would let us stay in. And so we would go down to the lake, go down to the dock, and we would swim. And then across the cove, you could swim across the cove, there was another... Uh, there was another family that owned a double dock. You know what I'm talking about? A double dock. It's got a. It's got two layers, and the top layer is a deck that you can jump off of. And it was, you know, maybe 15 feet or so up. And it was a lot of fun to jump off of. So my dad knew the people that owned that property, and so we used to swim across. And, you know, he had asked if that's okay, and so we swam across, and we would jump off the double dock. Well, one summer. We were doing that again and just went through the, the regular routine that we would do. We'd go down to our dock, we'd jump in the water, swim across the cove to the double dock, and then we'd start jumping off. Well, one summer we were doing that, and somebody came down the, the hill of that property, and they said, hey, what are you doing? And my older brother, Stephen, said, it's okay, we're Steve Suits kids. And this person, you know, kind of was like, um, okay, and left us alone. Um, now, we found out later that day, we told my dad the story, and my dad said, oh, I forgot to tell you, our friend sold that property. It's not theirs anymore. <laughs> and so we were jumping off this dock that we didn't know whose property it was, but the, the, the reason I tell you that, my brother was so confident in his faith in that name, all he had to do was drop the name of Steve Seuss, and he was confident that this is okay. Because we're Steve Suits kids. Now, the reason I tell you that story is that's really what David is doing here. He's not trusting in his own name. He's not trusting in his own might. His, own, his confidence is in the fact that he belongs to the Yahweh, the covenant Lord. You see that? And what we understand under the New Testament is really essentially that if we belong to Jesus, that we really can't face all kinds of situations. First, because we know that he has been through everything we've been through, that we can he identifies with us in our weakness and in our sufferings, that we can go back to who he is and to understand, okay, if I'm going through this, Jesus knows exactly what it is that I'm going through. And he faced even more than me. He can give me the strength by his power, not my own, to make it through this situation. But then the other thing it does for us is when we're when we're riddled down with guilt. Or with shame, or if we're afraid, we can go back and say, I belong to Jesus. Kind of like my brother was so confident in saying he didn't have to be afraid of what was going on because he said, I belong to Steve Seuss. Well, if we are facing whatever we're facing, whether it's enemies, whether it's persecution, whether it's uh, sinful accusation, whether it's guilt from sin, all we have to do is say, I belong to Jesus. He's promised to forgive me, and he's promised to take care of me. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But that's exactly what the gospel is. It's simple faith, trusting in the name of Jesus. And so that's the first thing we see, is that we can trust in the name of the Lord, which in the New Testament we understand is given to Jesus. The second thing we see is that the Lord hears and helps his people. We see this in verses 4 and 5. It says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Earlier in verse 2, he said, Oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. So David is believing that the Lord hears his prayer and that he will help him. Now, we don't always know what God's help is going to look like. For David, it didn't look like Saul stopping 
his, his chase. You know, David had to endure the rest of Saul's life being under threat of death. And David, maybe he had this grand picture that uh, Saul would completely repent and change his ways and apologize to David and make things right, but that never happened. And sometimes in our life, the way the Lord helps isn't the way we want him to help. But what he promises us is that he will be with us and that he will give us the strength to face whatever it is we need to go through. And that's really what David is depending on. And we see that in David's life, if you continue through his life, that God did give him the strength to, to face the situations that he came across. And so you see David's faith in the fact that he prays and really asks the Lord for help. Now, prayer in the church, um, you know, we, we talk about prayer a lot. We, we would all acknowledge that prayer is important, that we should make it a priority in our life. Uh, a couple of quotes you say, the, the first is Tim Keller's quote that was on our prayer card this week. It says, to pray is to admit that we are and always will be wholly dependent on God for everything. That's really what prayer is. Prayer is admitting, God, I can't do this alone. I need you. It's also acknowledging that God has more power than you. That he can do something that you can't. That's why you're praying. That's why you're asking him for help. And so prayer is really humbling yourself to acknowledge your own weakness. That's why it's so hard for people to pray sometimes. I don't like in, admitting that they're weak. This is why it's actually very hard for spouses to pray together. We don't like looking weak in front of each other. We don't like to, to, to be humbled in that way before each other. This is why it's hard for parents sometimes to pray with their kids. Because it makes you as a parent look weak. This is why it's hard for kids to pray with their parents, because it makes them look weak in front of their parents, and they want to be right. You see how that happens, how, how praying is really humbling yourself, is coming before the Lord and saying, I can't. I need you. It, it, it's just humbling yourself and being dependent on God, and that's what David is saying. He's saying, hear my prayer, give ear to my words, and help me. Now listen to this. Uh, I know all of us have said, there's truth to this. I don't want to like totally knock this phrase off of your, your, uh, your vocabulary. But we often say prayer is powerful. Who has said that before? I've said it. Still say it. Nothing necessarily wrong with saying that. But the truth behind that phrase is that prayer in and of itself is not powerful. It's the person you're praying to. The reason we pray, pray is not because we believe Prayer is powerful. The reason we pray is because we believe God is powerful. And if he's the one we're praying to, and if he has told us he wants us to pray to him, and he is willing to listen to and answer our prayers, that's really the reason we pray. Because that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we know and love. So let's just try to apply this uh, before we move on to our last point. Um. I've, I've said before, and I've heard people say before, uh, if you want to, if you want to have an event at your church where you only have a few people show up, if you want to have kind of an intimate small group event, uh, host a prayer night. Right. So, so let me just kind of give you a challenge, not to guilt you into this, but we try to pray here every other week on Wednesday night at six thirty p.m. You're welcome to come join us. It's one way that we as a church are trying to really encourage one another to pray. Another way we can apply this is every week we try to print out a card. It looks like this. Half sheet of paper on a card with prayer requests for the week that people have sent in. Another practical way that we can pray together and pray for each other. So... Those are some practical ways we can go through the exercises, but what's really going to help us see our need for prayer? The thing that's going to help us see our need for prayer is to acknowledge that every situation we go to, usually our response is pride. Now, what do I mean by that? If you face a situation and your immediate reaction is to go into problem-solving mode, that's because you believe you can What's at, the, what's at the root of that is pride. Now, I, listen, I'm preaching myself here. 
Um, I'm one of those that if I'm bombarded with a list of things that I've got to do, my immediate reaction is to start writing them down and creating my to-do list. And then what I'm telling myself mentally is, as long as I get this organized, I can accomplish this. I can, I can take care of this on my own. Very rarely is my first response, okay, Lord, I've got all these things on my mind. Let me just talk through those with you. Let me try to prioritize those with you. Let me, let me ask you, what would you do in this situation? Or what should I do on behalf of knowing you in this situation? See, our, often our response with whatever, if it's a high-pressure situation, and even if it's a mundane task, if it's a life decision that we have to make, whether it's a, a new job or a move or marriage or kids or whatever, how often is your response to go into the pros and cons list? And to go into things like, um, well, what would be best, you know, numerically? To start figuring things out logically before you even stop and say, Lord, what would you have me do? See, often our response is to go into self, uh, self-dependence and self-problem-solving mode. And listen, the Lord gives gifts to people to think through things. I'm not saying don't use the gifts that he's given you. I'm just saying, have, have you stopped and pray on behalf of those situations that you've had recently. Stop and pray. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to say is this really is a good habit to get into as a family. And if you're not a family, if you're not married, get into this habit yourself. And as you get into that habit, and as you you know meet that significant other, and then as you start talking about life together, pray together. Get into a habit of praying together. And then if you're not doing that now with your kids, start doing it. Demonstrate that humility together. If, if you need some help thinking through that, uh, I can try to help. But listen, I'm no expert in this. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing this perfectly either. So we can help each other. We can encourage each other. If you got some suggestions for me, I'm open to that. But let's encourage each other in this. So the Lord hears and helps. And then the last thing is, what is our response to that? If the Lord's name is great, and if he hears and helps us in our times of need, how do we respond? Well, David responds with sacrifice, which is really a, a, an offering of praise, and with thanks. So, in other words, David is responding with praise, with worship, and with thanks. And so let's just look at those briefly. The first thing he says is, uh, with a, in verse, I mean, verse 6, he says, with a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. Now, a free will offering in the Old Testament was an offering that went above and beyond what the Old Testament law required. So there was all kind of sacrifices and offerings that were required under, under the Old Testament law. If you sinned, you had to bring an animal and sacrifice that on the altar. Uh, if you got in a fight with a neighbor, there was something for that. If, so, you know, any of these things that happened, there were certain offerings that went along with that. There were also calendar-type offerings that you offered just generally. So whether it was, you know, whatever, once a week or once a year, there were also offerings that were required under the law. The free will offering was offerings that people would give out of their abundance and out of their joy that wasn't required by the law. It was just because they wanted to give back to the Lord because of all that he had done for them. That's what David is saying. He's saying, out of the abundance of gratitude because of what you've done for me, I'm going to offer a free will offering to you because of all that you've done for me, because you've provided me, because you've delivered me. And so I'm going to offer out of the abundance of my life because of how you've provided for me. And then we also say, see that he's giving thanks. And this really, these two things go together, don't they? A free will offering and gratitude really go together. So he's giving thanks. Now, I do not often preach on giving, right? I, I pretty much go easy on you most of the time. But when a passage seems to tie in, I'm going to try to speak to that a little bit in application. So to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about milk. How do we get milk? So milk, um, you know, you can buy milk either as skim milk or as 1% milk or as 2% milk. Uh, skim milk means it has no fat in it. 
1% milk means it has 1% of fat in it. 2% milk means it has 2% of fat in it. Whole milk, I don't know if you knew this, but whole milk has usually anywhere from 3.5% to 5% fat. Now, if you go from skim milk, which is like white water, uh, and then you go to 1%, you can taste that difference, right? A little bit, you know, that fat, it, it gives you a little bit of substance. Um, well, then you go from 1% to 2%, which is our family preference, or at least it's mine. Uh, really, mine would be whole milk. But um, we go from 1% to 2%, and then you can taste that difference. But man, mm, you go from 2% to that whole milk, now we're getting somewhere, right? Y'all with me? All right, so you can taste that fat, right? And that's good stuff. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but my grandmother used to pour half and half on her cereal. She, that's how she used to drink her cereal, because she liked that you know, nice, hearty, fatty milk, that creamy milk. And so half and half, you didn't know, half and half is half whole you know, whipping cream, which is like 35% fat. Um, and uh, milk, so it's half milk, half, half whipping cream. Um, and so then you get, with half and half, you, usually they say that's about 10 to 12% fat in that milk. So what I want you to do is I want you to go home and do some taste tests, all right? This will be a fun experiment for you and the kids. Uh, if you've got milk in your fridge and if you've got half and half in your fridge, I want you to pour a little, you know, you don't have to get sick, but pour, pour yourself a little sample of each of those. Taste the milk, 1%, 2%, whatever it is, and then taste that half and half and taste the difference, that 10 to 12%. Now, why do I tell you this? Because in the Bible, now this is, you know, people have different understandings of this, but generally we say that people are to give 10% of their income. That means 10% of what the Lord has provided for you, you give back to Him out of gratitude and out of thanksgiving. Now, the average amount that people give, and this is, I don't know how they do these surveys, but they say that average amount that people give in church is around 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and the reason I gave you that milk illustration is you can feel the difference. And so I, I just want to kind of maybe give you a little bit of a heart challenge here. Do you give? When you give, is it just like, oh yeah, I forgot, here's some cash in my pocket? Or do you give with thought and with intentionality because of what the Lord has provided for you? And do you give? Now, I'm not saying you have to give 10%. I think that's a general, generally a pretty good principle to follow. But what the Bible does say is give with joy. And out of the abundance of what the Lord has provided you, give back to Him in worship and in praise. And if you're able to give above that, then do that with joy too. Give generously is what the New Testament says. Now the only way we're going to do that, especially in a money-craving culture, the only way we're going to do that is, is if we understand and really believe that the Lord's got us, that He has provided for us, and that even the job and the gifts that He has provided for me are because He has given those to me, not because I've worked them up on my own. And so even my income that I work hard for, I can only do that because the Lord has enabled me to do that. And so if I am able to see everything I have comes from the Lord, and if I'm also able to look at Jesus' life, what he did for others and what he has done for me, that he gave everything generously on my behalf, that's what's going to start melting our hearts to give back to him in worship and in praise and thanks. And that's really what David's doing here. When he says, I'm going to offer a free will offering you, he's saying, Lord, you have provided abundantly for you. You have spared my life. You have given me my life. You have saved me and vindicated me. I'm going to worship you because of everything that you've done for me. Now, all of this comes back to whether or not you believe that the Lord has done anything for you. And so let me just ask you that as we wrap up. Has God been good to you? Has he done anything for you? At the very minimum, of, at, at the very lowest point of your life, what you can say is, I have everything I need because God has given me his own son. Amen. Regardless of what my bank account
regardless of whether I have a job or not, I know that the Lord has provided everything I need because he who did not spare his own son will he not also give me everything I need. That's what Romans 8 says. And so let me just end with this. Do you believe what God has done for you in Jesus? What did he do? Jesus came in the form of man. He lived as a poor man on earth. He was humbled to the point of death, even death on the cross. And he gave his life for his people. Sacrificed his own life because we deserve death. He died the death that we deserve. And he rose from the dead. And he offers forgiveness, justification, vindication, and righteousness to anyone who believes. So whether or not you get anything else, that's enough. Everything else you have is grace upon grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us as sinners. Thank you that, Jesus, you have given much to us. Thank you that there is no other name given to mankind by which we may be saved than the name of Jesus. Thank you that you have been given that name, Jesus, the name above every name, that you are our God, you are our Lord. And we pray that we would trust in you, trust in your name, that we would trust in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, we pray that you would fill us with gratitude, fill us with thanksgiving, help us to see that everything we have comes from you, and help us to respond in praise and in worship and in generosity to, to your church, but also to one another and to those in need because of everything that you have done for us, Jesus. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. And now, appropriately, we will respond by giving to the Lord in worship. And so we're going to sing this song, I Will Trust in the Lord. You can stand and sing with us, and as that plane comes by, uh, you can place your offering in there if you would like. Uh, if you don't have an opportunity to do that now, you can do that following worship as well. Um, but let's stand and sing and give and praise God for who He is.
Great Del Art. And let me let me give thanks. Let me pray for our giving this morning. Father, thank you for providing for us. Thank you for giving to us generously in your Son. And we pray that you may use the gifts that have been given today for your glory in your church and in this community and in the world. In Jesus' name.
face towards you and give you his peace in the name of Jesus, his son. Amen. Now let's sing that together over one another. Thank you. 